I'll do the well thing and then you can do the uh, call work thing. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are thankful for the opportunity to once again meet together with how many restrictions there are around the world. I have sent you a couple updates from Missions Works, and the restrictions are even heavier than here in the United States. So we are thankful for the opportunity to come together and to sing and to join together and corporately worship. The only announcement that I have is that there will, after a months-long absence be a joint service at Bible Chapel of Delhi Hills on September 13th at 6 p.m. It will be outside. They have a, a big yard, kind of like what we have out here. And so I presume that you'll have to bring your own lawn chairs and all that, but uh, details have yet to be released. So uh, please put that on your calendar if that's something you're interested in attending. And uh, let me know. I will send uh, details on you when I have those details. Uh, let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. Any other announcements? Oh, uh, Life Forward Walk. Is it the day before? 12th? Okay, 12th. So um, that is, uh, Life Forward is the uh, local pregnancy resource center, and uh, we've partnered with them many times over the decades, probably. And uh, their Walk for Life is coming up on the 12th of September. And I think it's something like 10 a.m. I've sent you details in the past, but I will send you on any more details that I receive as the date gets closer. Any other announcements? Okay. Seeing none, Alex, come open our service. Hear these words from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now please take your red handle and turn to number 441 for our song of praise this morning called Jesus Shall Reign. And as you turn there, look at stanza number one and then stanza number five. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. And then uh, stanza number five. Let every creature rise and bring peculiar honors to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. We'll see how this song ties in with our scripture passage, or our sermon passage for this morning. Uh, that Jesus is King over all the earth, and all creatures obey Him, or, and will obey Him. Let us stand and sing. Jesus shall reign.
toward the back to eight number, page number 846. In the back, after all of the hymns, page number 846. We're going to recite the Nicene Creed as a body this morning. <clears throat> Nicene Creed, if you don't know, what originated at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, and it came after, or in the middle, of a controversy about the nature of Christ. Is he God in the flesh, or is he merely a man? And the formulators of the Nicene Creed affirm with great vigor that he is very God of very God. And these truths in the Creed uh, can be said by every Christian in the universal church. So let us recite this creed together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten but not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and who was made man, and was crucified also for us under the conscious Pilate. He suffered and he was buried, and in the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Take your red hymnals and turn to number 490 for our song of confession. Number 490. Please stand and let us sing. Mm -hmm. population of only about 400,000, they're a pretty 
small country. Uh, they speak English, Spanish, Mayan, uh, Garifuna, and Creole. Uh, they have Roman Catholics, Pentecostals, Anglicans, Seventh-day Adventists, and Mennonites. Peace and plentiful land attract refugees from neighboring countries. Neighboring countries. Tourism is the main source of revenue. Um, recently, the country has been producing large amounts of illegal drugs and become associated with Mexican drug cartel. Uh, we can pray about many people live in pro uh, poverty, large number of orphans. The majority of uh, people in Belize profess Christianity, but uh, syncretism, paganism, and black magic is common. Belize is a common destination for short-term mission trips, which provide many benefits, but also cause a dependent a dependent spirit among the locals. There's a great need for a gospel witness um, that is permanent and that is a gospel uh, light to the people who live there. So let us pray for the people in Belize and their need of the gospel. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to lift up to you this morning the people uh, in Belize both the, the true believers that live in Belize and uh, the people who don't yet believe in your Son. Lord, we ask uh, for the true believers that live there that you give them strength in a country uh, like theirs where there's so much paganism around them, there's corruption. We ask that you give them strength and confidence and boldness uh, to bring a gospel witness to the people around them, the people they work with, the people they love. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you uh, grant them to plant biblical churches. And we ask, Lord, that you grant us to help support them. We ask, Lord, that um, from people in the United States that have a surplus of resources, that you grant us men who would be willing to go and plant churches in Belize to um, help edify the believers there in Belize, to strengthen them, um, to show the people in Belize the way that God has instituted his church uh, through local bodies who preach the gospel on the Lord's Day week to week and are a gospel witness throughout the week to the people they, uh, they have influence over. And Lord, uh, to the unbelievers, for the unbelievers in Belize, we ask that you grant them faith and repentance, that you work in their hearts only uh, the what only you can do, that you would take their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, make them love the sweetness of the gospel and hate their sin. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, Amen. Please take your red pencil once again and turn to number 261. 261 for our song of assurance, What Wondrous Love Is This? And look at the second stanza. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. I will sing to God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb, who is the great I Am. While millions join the theme, I will sing. I will sing. While millions join the theme, the theme I will sing. Let our hearts be filled with joy such as this, that we will just sing to the Lamb, who is God in the flesh, who is sovereign over all, because of the salvation he has brought us. You may remain seated. And let us sing.
number 305. I'm sorry. Please take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And we know from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, that the one that Isaiah saw sitting on the throne is Jesus Christ. And at the sight of Jesus Christ, he was undone, ruined by his holiness. And he couldn't help but praise Jesus Christ in all his glory. Now, take your red hymnal and turn to number 305. <clears throat> number 305 for our song of thanksgiving, Arise, My Soul, Arise. Let us stand and sing.
Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we have not been present with Isaiah when he saw you high and exalted, seated on a throne with the train of your robe filling the temple, nor did we see the seraphim with their six wings, nor did we hear the voices crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of your glory. And yet, in your word, we see of your wonderful generosity and loving kindness to us in the person of Jesus Christ, your only Son. We read of his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and we see his holiness displayed all throughout the scripture, but especially in the cross work of Christ for your wrath for those of us who were unholy, which is all of us, was completely and utterly satisfied on the cross because Jesus was holy, holy, holy. And we rightly, like Isaiah, proclaim, Woe to me, I am ruined, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, I am a person of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So as we peer into your word this morning, Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to see your holiness on display, your loving kindness, your generosity, your grace and mercy. As the text specifically says, mercy, and shows your compassion toward this man with a legion of unclean spirits. Not only teach us from your word what it says, but apply to our hearts what it means for us, how we should live it out. For scripture has but one meaning, and yet it has many different applications. So we pray that we would find that one meaning, that it's the word would be explains with clarity as it, is, as it is exposited, and it would be applied in ways that convict the hearts and point us to the Savior that we have in Jesus and how we should live in light of his work on our behalf. We pray these things because of Jesus, by his Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Have you ever heard someone refer to someone as a changed man, or a changed woman, a changed person? For example, maybe a, a man had a traumatic experience, and it changed him for the better, because it made him more careful or cautious for the rest of his life about the consequences of his actions or the consequences of others' actions upon him. Or... On the more negative side of things, maybe it changed him for the worse. Maybe he was more anxious or suicidal or anxious because of this traumatic experience. Or, hopefully, at some point in your life, you've heard of someone being called a changed man or a changed woman or a changed young person because of Jesus coming into their life. Now, that's the best kind of changed person, changed man, changed woman, because there is a spiritual transformation going on. And that's actually what we're going to read about in our scripture passage for this morning found in Mark 5. So if you haven't yet turned to the book of Mark in chapter 5, please do so. I'm going to start reading in verse 1, going all the way down to verse 20. This is the story of the demon-possessed man or demons-possessed man, because he had a legion of demons inside of him. So let's read Mark 5, verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. 
and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. A remarkable story, isn't it? A remarkable story of what someone's life looks like when Jesus changes them. Now in the last passage, if you recall, it's Jesus and the disciples, they leave, it's calm, all of a sudden this squall, this huge storm, winds and waves coming from all directions, and the, the waves start coming into the boat. Meanwhile, of course, Jesus is sleeping, and they wave Jesus up and says, Don't you care, teacher? And what does Jesus do? He says, Quiet, be still, and everything is calm. Not only the wind, but the waves become like a sheet of ice, too. Jesus showed his power over creation, the power over the chaos of creation during that particular moment. And we actually see a similar pattern here in our passage for today. Jesus intervened in the midst of the chaos, and peace resulted. Before Jesus intervenes, there was chaos. After Jesus intervened, there was peace. So in this story of this man whose name we don't know, we see what he was like before Jesus changed him, and then we see what he looked like after Jesus changed him, after Jesus transformed him. Think of it, this is a kind of an odd analogy, but think of it like those before and after pictures you see on, on the, the TV ads or on social media. You know, before this weight loss program, this is what the person looked like, and then after, here's what they look like. So we're going to see the before and after of this particular man, this demoniac, as he's called. And as we look at him, we're going to see a picture of ourselves as well, what it looks like for Jesus to change our hearts. Now, that might seem like a stretch, like, wait a second, you're going to compare us as non-demon-possessed people to a demon-possessed person? And yes, and here's the reason. And it's because we often underestimate how bad we really are without Christ. Because sometimes we, we tend to think, well, I'm not that bad of a person. You know, I'm not living in tombs, and I'm not 
shrieking out day and night. I'm not cutting myself. I'm not as bad as the people that you see in prison and on the news for doing heinous crimes. But in doing so, in downplaying the badness of ourselves pre-Christ, we actually downplay the wonder of Christ's conversion as well. Because conversion is change, it's transformation. So the big idea from this passage, which we're going to apply to ourselves, is this. Jesus changes people. So if Jesus has changed you, you must live like a changed person. Because Jesus has changed people, you must live like a changed person. So how does Jesus change people? How can he change you if you're an unbeliever? How can he change you if you are not already in Christ? Or if you are a believer, how has he changed you? In the past. And we're going to see two ways taken right from our text. We could put them into one sentence like this. Jesus changes us from rebels into disciples. So just like in the storm it went from chaos to calm, at the moment Jesus declared it so, we're going to see how we are changed from rebels into disciples. The before and the after. From rebels into disciples. So here's the before, which is Jesus changes us from rebels, from being rebels. We were, we used to be rebels like the demon-possessed man in our stories. We lived apart from and against the Savior who came into the world to save us from our sins, Jesus. So now let's dig into the text, starting at verse 1, and we're going to see this pre-conversion states of this man who is often referred to as the demoniac of Gadara. Verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Now, the they in this verse, if you have to back up, you'll see in chapter 4, this is Jesus and the disciples and maybe some others as well who ventured out in their boats after Jesus had just called the lake. It's probably still nighttime at this point. So they reached the other side of the lake, which wasn't a big lake, Sea of Galilee and the lake being the same thing. And as they went across the lake to this region of the Gerasenes, they're traveling east. Now the Gerasenes, you might see a footnote in your Bible there. There's debate about what that actually refers to. Your footnote probably says something like, some manuscripts, Gadarenes, or other manuscripts, Gergesenes, and the reason is there's debate about what precise city is actually being referred to. It probably refers to the city or the town, a small town of Gursa, or Cursa, depending on how you pronounce it, located in the middle of the shore on the eastern side. And this was located in the Decapolis, which we're going to read about later. This is the collection of ten cities that is the region around uh, the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River, mostly to the east of the Jordan River. So verse 2, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an unpure spirit came to meet him. So in other words, immediately after stepping out onto the lands, a man with an impure spirit was there to meet him. Now, Luke's account in chapter 8 tells us that there were actually two men, but Mark focuses on just the one man. Luke also records that this man had not worn clothes in a long time. So we presume that when he approaches Jesus, he's actually stark naked, which makes things a lot more interesting when you read this story and how Jesus did not react in any sort of shock. Now, Mark has used this phrase demon or impure spirit, which is the same thing, several different times. So flip back to chapter 1, for instance, just two or three pages in your Bible. And you'll see chapter 1, verse 21. So this is Jesus going into the Sabbath, going into the synagogue, excuse me, on the Sabbath, beginning to teach. And just as they were in there, an impure spirit, a man with an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And of course, Jesus then says, Be quiet. Same words he gives to the, the sea in chapter 4. 
come out of him, and of course, verse 26, the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Or skip over to chapter 3, for instance. Here, Jesus is accused in verse 20 of being possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. So we don't have an actual instance of demons, but he's being accused of being one. And of course, Jesus refutes that and says, how can Satan drive out Satan? So when this man came out of the tombs to meet him, the tombs probably refers to these natural caves that were in the chambers of a, a mountain or a hillside, these chambers that were there. And obviously, because they're tombs, there's going to be dead bodies there, which is a problem because if you know anything about Jewish religion or history, anyone who was in the vicinity of or touched a dead body was considered to be ceremonially unclean. So not only was his spirit unclean, it says he has an impure spirit, but he also lived in an unclean place, a tomb, and he did unclean things. It says he lived in the tombs, verses 3 and 4, and he goes on to say that no one could bind him anymore. In other words, they tried to. They tried to bind him because he's, he's demon-possessed. He's scary. He's doing scary things, and they want to keep him restrained. But it says, no, no. He had often been chained hand and foot. He tore the chains apart and he broke the irons on his feet. So it wasn't just that they could clamp them up, but then somehow he's able to slip out. No, he broke the chains and the bonds that were holding him down. So in other words, this wasn't just a person who was in a foul mood. This was a person who had superhuman strength from a superhuman source. The text goes on to say that no one was strong enough to subdue him. Now, the text doesn't say that he was violent towards others. You would assume that, but the text doesn't say that. But here's what it does say. Verse 5. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So he's inwardly conflicted. Obviously, we're going to learn here soon that he has a multitude of demons inside of him. But he's also inflicted. He's self-inflicting himself because he does not know the peace of Jesus Christ. I mean, imagine if there was someone in your neighborhood you would consider to be filthy, ceremonially unclean, who is evil, he has unclean spirits, and he sounds scary, making all sorts of screeching, scary calls and noises, no matter day and night, and you tried to contain him, to restrain him, but no matter what you did, he got out. How scared would you be? Would you sleep well at night? Probably not. Just this past week, I was working on our our sound system here last week, if you were here, you heard some FM or AM radio come through, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. And so I turn on the sound system, and I hear the most creepy, screeching voice I have ever heard in my life. And it wasn't coming from in here, it was coming from somewhere else. And it was actually the nursery monitor speaker that somehow things had just been set up that was very scary. And I immediately got goosebumps. I didn't know what it was. Like, what is that noise? Where is it coming from? Now imagine that it was an actual person in your neighborhood making all those creepy, screeching noises. That would be a very scary thing. You're in the middle of the night, sleeping, and all of a sudden you hear this screech, this cry. That's enough to give you nightmares every night. Now, as Jesus, as Mark goes on in his account here, verse 6, he's actually elaborating on the story a little bit. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of them. So in other words, he sees the disciples and Jesus coming ashore in the boat, which if you remember was probably, if archaeology holds true, about a 27-foot boat. So they start coming toward the shore, and being the scary guy that he is, he wants to go out and give him a hard time. 
And so they're starting to come in. But as he gets down there, and he starts to, to confront who he apparently sees as the leader of the group, who we know as Jesus, but he didn't know who he was yet. But as soon as he gets close to him, he sees who he is, and what does he do? He fall, falls down on his knees in front of him. And then he shouts at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. Now this isn't the bowing of the knee of someone who is worshiping Jesus as a disciple. That's not what's going on here. It seems like he's bowing because he's compelled to do so. Do you remember the account at the end of the Gospel accounts where... The uh, disciples and Jesus are in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the army, this regiment, comes out, and he says, I am he. And what happens to them? They draw back and they fall to the ground. That seems to be similar to what's happening here. He doesn't seem to be falling down voluntarily as if, oh, here's my master, here's my Lord, I want to worship you. No, he's falling down because he realizes that Jesus is his authority. And we know that this must be the case, that he's not a worshiper, a follower, a disciple of Jesus, by what he says here in verse 7. Don't torture me. What do you want with me? He's not bowing in submission to Jesus' lordship. He's trying to get Jesus to not do what he can rightfully do to this man with the demons. And then Mark backs up a minute and says in verse 8, for Jesus had said to him, in other words, past tense, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. In other words, the second statement, verse 8, actually came first, chronologically speaking. Jesus commanded the demons to come out of him. Then the man replied by yelling at him this question. In other words, he's trying to delay the inevitable. He knows that Jesus has the authority, and he wants Jesus to not do what he is going to do. So in other words, taken together, we realize the demons are asking him a question because they know that they are going to have to obey him. And yet they don't want to. They undoubtedly knew who he was, what was veiled or blinded to those unbelievers in that area. They just thought of him as a miracle worker or as a good person. These demons knew who he was. And they knew that he was their authority. I mean, we've seen this theme come up time and time again in these first four, now five chapters of the book of Mark, that Jesus is Lord. He has the authority. Let me prove it to you. Look back at chapter one again. Verse 22. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. And then verse 27, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. Now flip over to chapter 2, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he had said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. How can he forgive sins unless he has divine authority to forgive them? Chapter 2, verse 27. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Lord has the idea of authority. He's the Lord of this day. Chapter 3. This is the healing of the man on the Sabbath day. Jesus, in verse 3, says, stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked these hypocritical Pharisees, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? They remained silent. And then in verse 5, at the end, we read and say, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Who can have the authority to heal someone who by birth was born deformed? Except person for our Lord Jesus Christ. He is and has the authority. Okay, now back over to chapter 5 and look at the end of verse 
7. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. So this demon-possessed man asks Jesus to swear, to give an oath, to not torture him. In God's name, don't torture me. Now, that's a little confusing because what is Jesus doing that's torturing to him? Well, we, it makes more sense when we get to, when we look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, which is Matthew's account of the story, when he says this. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? What is this appointed time? When you piece together other scripture passages, this is the time when Jesus puts everything under his feet. These are the final days, the eschaton, if you want to use this fancy word, Jesus' second coming. Here's a verse that elaborates on that for us. This is 2 Peter 2, verse 4. This is a very long phrase with all these ifs, so um, keep that in mind why it's a partial sentence. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So Jesus, God, did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he punished them by sending them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Well, that final judgment that they will receive is on that final day. So the before the appointed time means that they think that Jesus is going to destroy them before his second coming, and his first coming instead. And for them, that will be torture in their minds. For Jesus to destroy them before Jesus' return, his second coming would have been torture. So what does Jesus do? How does he respond to this demand that he not torture them? Look at verse Verses uh, 8 and 9. He doesn't respond to this demand for an oath. He just says, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then he says, what is your name? He doesn't give in to their demands to swear out to torture them. He just asks the question, what is your name? Now that's an interesting question to ask. Why does he ask him his name? What does it matter? Now, there have been lots of ideas. If you pull a commentary off the shelf or even a study Bible, you're going to have several different ideas proposed to you. And I think there are two simple answers to this question. Why does Jesus ask the man his name? For one, I think he wants to draw out the fact that this man's problem is severe. He has not just one demon, but he has a multitude of of demons residing in him. But I think there's another reason, and I don't find this in any of the commentaries, but I, I, I think we can see it in other passages, that Jesus asks him his name because he cares for him. Remember how he, he talks to people and he says their name? How he shows compassion on the crowds? This is not something abnormal to Jesus. He is a compassionate God who wants to know people and their needs. And he has compassion on this man and his horrible states. And then in verse, the end of verse 9, we read the response from this man. My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, just as an aside, who's doing the talking in this passage? Whether the man or all the demons combined, or they're a leader of the demons, we can't exactly be sure. I mean, either way, it's the man's voice box being used, so that's why scripture says, the man said, but probably it was under the influence of this plethora of demons. Legion is a military word. It can refer to an army of anywhere from four to 6,000 soldiers. So if you take the word literally, this man had Four to 6,000 demons inside of him, impure spirits. Even if you don't take it literally, it refers to a multitude, a host of demons inside of him. So no wonder he was in pain. No wonder he would cry out. No wonder he would cut himself with stones. One demon enough was torture, let alone a multitude, a host of demons. 
Now that the man's commands to Jesus, the demon's commands, command to Jesus to swear to him that he would torture them, the man begins to beg Jesus again and again to not send them out of the area. In other words, this man and his demons realize that Jesus is the authority and they can do nothing without his permission. So what does Jesus do? How does he respond? He has mercy on this man. Verse 11. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. So he gave permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. And finally, this man is freed from the demons and impure spirits that have been afflicting him for weeks, months, years perhaps. We tend to think of the demonic man, the story of the demonic man as being an extreme example, and in a sense that's true. I mean, none of us have probably ever been oppressed or possessed by a demon, let alone a, a multitude of demons. And yet, oppression by evil is not an uncommon experience, right? Think of the godly Job in the book by his name. Job isn't afflicted by demons per se, but he was afflicted by Satan himself. God brought up his name before Satan, and what did Satan do? Satan said, does he follow you for nothing? He was, Jesus, Job was certainly a follower of God. So evil is not an unheard of experience, and yet we can relate to this quote-unquote demoniac, demoniac of Gadara. Not because of current demonic oppression, but as I said earlier, that it's our pre-Christ condition, our states that we can relate to. Because our condition without Christ was not much better than the man who had hundreds or maybe even thousands of demons inside of him. And we know this because of a very clear passage in Ephesians 2. If you'd like to turn there with me, you can. Here's what he says, Paul, Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You notice what he says there? Previously, you used to be dead in your transgressions and sins. You used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and you used to follow the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. In other words, Satan. Just as this demon-possessed man did what the demons did, how they influenced him, and in some ways he had no choice. Similarly, we as Christians in our pre-Christ state followed demonic sources, namely Satan himself. We followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Satan. So in order to truly grasp the amazing transformation that has occurred when we believed in Christ, we have to first understand what our lives were like outside of Christ, pre-Christ. Now, there's some examples that we can think of that will help us feel the weight of our pre-Christ condition. For instance, which sin most easily besets you? Which sin is most tempting to you? These temptations, these sins, are reminders of the remainder of sin that even Christians have inside of us. And this temptation may be a glimpse into what passions you would give into wholeheartedly, or more so than what tempts you now, apart from the work of Christ. These temptations are a glimpse into your heart and what you'd be like without Christ. So, for instance, a sexual temptation a great temptation for you. Without Christ, maybe it would be that 
There would be nothing holding you back from every and any sexual desire that you could or want to pursue. Or think of despair and worry and fear. Imagine now how hopeless you would be without Christ. And yet, some sins are not as, at least in the world's eyes, as heinous. They're more, you could say, respectable. That's what Jerry Bridges called them in his book, Respectable Sins. Because sin doesn't have to be something gross or heinous in the eyes of culture, because sin is a transgression against God's holiness, his love, his mercy, his grace. And sometimes those same characteristics are valued by our world. So take pride, for example. Pride is something that's despicable in God's eyes, and yet the world congratulates people who are, quote-unquote, self-made, that they pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. People who have a bravado, a machismo mentality, they walk around with this, like, this big swagger. The world tends to look at that and say, wow, such a confident man or woman. But maybe without Christ, a person this proud would never open the pages of the Bible, would never hearken the doors of the church, because they think, I don't need God. I have everything I need right here. So maybe that was what you would be like apart from Christ. Maybe it's not sexual temptation. Maybe it's not fear and worry. Maybe it's just the general pride of life. Without Christ, no heart will be changed. Without Christ, no heart can be changed. Without Christ, no passion can be subdued. And without Christ, no passion will be subdued. Because without Christ, we're all rebels. Whether we have demons or not, we are all rebels against Jesus' authority. So that was the first way that Jesus changes us. He changes us from being rebels. Now, secondly, the second way that Jesus changes us, changes people, is he changes us into disciples. So this is the after, to use that, that uh, uh, infomercial that you see on TV example of before and after weight loss. The before was, well, we were like pre-Christ, without Christ, rebels against him, who will not submit to him, who do not want to submit to him. Now, because of the influence of Christ in our lives, we are disciples. We are followers of him. So Jesus changes us into disciples. To go back to that infomercial weight loss analogy, the, the ads, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but the ads make it look like their product alone is the solution to weight loss. You ever notice that? Man, if you just do this Bowflex, you'll look like those people on the, on the commercial. Or if you, uh, if you follow this particular nutritionist, man, you will, you will have just the perfect figure and all these toned muscles, and, and this alone is the key. But the reality is, of course, it's always more than one factor, right? It's not only exercise, but it's also diet. It's not only diet, but it's also exercise. Because no one loses 100 pounds by what they eat alone. Nor does a person, person lose that much weight by exercising alone. It's a combination of all these things. Yet, not so with Christ. It's not a combination of factors or sources that, that each thing have to, has to do its different thing. No, this is a singular origin. Now, admittedly, there are a lot of things going on in a person's heart at the time of conversion. But they all come from one source. And that is God. It's a triune God work in our hearts. For instance, God elected the person. God, that's how the Father, God the Son, converts us from darkness to light. And God the Spirit regenerates us. He makes us born again. Here's how Paul phrases it in 2 Corinthians 4. God said, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. One source, and it is that of Jesus, the Holy Spirit and God the Father, the triune God transformed us. So at the word of Jesus, this man's heart 
was transformed. But first we need to pick up where we left off in the middle of verse 13. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake, this is the Sea of Galilee, and were drowned. So they got the permission that they wanted to enter the pigs. They entered the pigs and then immediately committed suicide right there in that the lake, the sea. Now this might sound cruel to you. Jesus rid the man of his demons only to, in effect, kill the pigs? I mean, doesn't Jesus care about animals? Well, to be clear, Jesus does care for animals. Just like in Matthew 6 when he says, you know, the birds of the air that God provides for them. But then what does he say after that in verse 26? Which matters more to God, birds or people? He answers that question by saying this. Are you not much more valuable than they are? We are more valuable than the animals. So he cares about the souls of people, of humans, more than the bodies of of pigs. So by ridding this man of his demons, he was showing love and compassion and mercy to this man. Verse 14 tells us the response of those who were the pig herders, as it were. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Remember, everywhere Jesus goes, there's a crowd, right? So Jesus sends the pigs off. The pigs commit suicide. The pig herders have nothing else to do now because their pigs are dead. So they go into town and say, this guy killed all my pigs. And they come out and say, what's going on out here? There must be something crazy happening because there's all, sort of, there's all these carcasses of pigs in the lake. And here's this man who made it happen. The crowd coming out to be clear, was not coming out to be his disciples. It's simply that he was a wonder worker, maybe he was a rabble rouser, and he was causing all sorts of trouble, and they wanted to figure out what was going on here. Yet what do they see when they arrive? We see this in verse 15. They came out to see what had happened, but what they found was something surprising to them. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Notice the contrast between the changed man and the townspeople. They're there worrying about it. These townspeople are like, what's going on here? They're freaking out. But what did the man who was just released from demon oppression, what's he doing? He was sitting, first of all. This was an abnormal occurrence for someone who was so disturbed that he ran around without clothing. He cried out and cut himself regularly. What is he sitting there doing? Well, he's probably sitting there learning from Jesus. He's trying to be this man's disciple. Of course, now he's dressed, no longer streaking through the community. And it says he's in his right mind, meaning the influence of the demons upon his heart was now gone. But meanwhile, the townspeople were freaked out. They were worried. They were afraid, it says. Verse 16 and 17 elaborate on that. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and they told about the pigs as well. And then the people begin to plead with Jesus to leave the region? So think how odd this is. This man's conversion is the best thing that's ever happened to their community. And they want the cause of this man in his now peaceful state to leave? He's a peacemaker and they want him to leave? The truth of the matter is that unbelievers are not going to be converted because of the power of God, because of the power of Jesus. They will be and cannot help but be repulsed. Sometimes we can expect unbelievers to act like believers when, when they see God at work. But that's not the case. Unbelievers 
will not be transformed by just a miraculous display of God's power. After all, they have it in front of us at all times. Creation displays the glory of God. The firmament, the heavens show his handiwork. Psalm 19. And yet they still don't believe. Why? It's because power is attractive in a sense because they want to see what's going on, but it's not enough to transform a person's heart. What we see in the person of the demoniac is where his heart was transformed. Because the story doesn't end there. We, we now get back to the story of the man. Verse 18. He was sitting there. He's presumably talking with Jesus and learning from him. And at this point, they're asking him to leave, Jesus to leave. And so he takes him up on their offer and he's going to leave the area. So what does the man do? Verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begs him to go with him. So previously, think of the irony of this. Previously, this demoniac was begging Jesus to not send the demons away, to not torture him in that way. And now what's he begging him to do? He's begging Jesus to stay with him. He's begging his deliverer to stay with him. Now, this is a, a good request, a noble request. This is evidence of saving faith, conversion. He's saying, I want to be one of your close disciples too. That's what it means by him sitting there and trying to learn from Jesus. And yet Jesus has other plans for him. We read that in verse 19. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. In other words, Jesus isn't upset with him. He's not against having other disciple, per se. He wants disciples to come to him, and yet he wants this new disciple to take the good news throughout their area, the Decapolis. And he wants this recently converted man to be the means by which these people receive the gospel. So he asks them in verse 20, the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. The Decapolis was a, a league of ten cities. Um, Decapolis, deck meaning ten, prefix for ten. This is probably where he was from because it says there how much God had done for him. He wants, wants him to go home to his own people. These cities were a collection of cities that were delivered from the oppression of the Maccabees by the Romans, but of course now they're under Roman rule. So they're politically free from one group, but now under the political oppression of another group. And yet the deliverance that they need most of all is not a political deliverance. They need a gospel deliverance. And Jesus used this man to spread that good news. Now, the pastoral epistles tell us that new converts can't be elders, but they do make great evangelists. If you've ever known someone who has recently received Christ by faith and repentance, they cannot help but tell other people. We have an example here in our own congregation of Marlene's brother Eugene, just in the last week or half, week and a half or so, he was given the gospel, presented the gospel by his other brother, Vernon, and Vernon's pastor. They tell him about the saving grace that's in Christ. He believes, he repents, and those final, I forget how many days he lived after that conversion, a week or two, what he was doing was he wanted scripture to be read to him. He wanted to talk about the gospel with his relatives, who, many of which did not know Christ. Maybe our church needs a little bit of that new convert energy and enthusiasm where we're just excited to tell people about Jesus, to command them to repent in the name of Jesus. Are you a disciple of Jesus? If so, 
you will be an evangelist for Jesus. So do you tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ? How God had mercy on you in the person of Jesus? This is a necessary action of a disciple. A witnessing disciple is a real disciple. On the other hand, do you act like an unbeliever? And not evangelize. You don't care. Now, to be clear, and I've said this many times in our church before, the results of evangelism must not be equated to the actual act of evangelism. So if you can't think of a, someone who's ever come to faith in Christ because of your witness, that doesn't mean you haven't been evangelistic. That just means that God has not shown fruit from that particular witnessing that you have done. If you act like an unbeliever and not evangelized, at worst, it may be a sign that you're not actually a believer. Because those who are disciples of Jesus want to tell people about the good news that they have received, what God had done for him, what Jesus had done for him is what our text says, how Jesus had shown mercy on him. If you are a Christian, you will want to show mercy that show what mercy that God has shown to you, to others. So at worst, if you're not witnessing, it may be a sign that you're not a believer. And at best, it may be a sign that you're backslidden or rebellious at the moment. You are temporarily acting like an unbeliever, what you were like pre-Christ, or what you would be like without Christ right now. Notice what the man did with his freedom. Did he run away, leaping and dancing with joy, that he was finally free from all of these oppressing demons inside of him? Did he go down to the lake and see the remains of the pigs in the lake? Or did he sit at the feet of Jesus, wanting to learn? Ask yourself, what do I do with my freedom. For Paul says this in Galatians 1, uh, Galatians 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And he talks about later in the chapter about the works of the flesh being evident, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control. Or 1 Peter 2, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. What's interesting about that 1 Peter passage is the context. Because that freedom that he's talking about there, and the evil that we might be tempted to do, are about this. He says in verse 13, submit yourselves, the Lord's sake, to every human Authority. And in verse 17, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So freedom in Christ not only shows itself in how you interact with God and how you treat sin, but it also has to do with how you treat others and how you treat the governing authorities. Jesus puts it well in his words in Luke 12. Where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. You are free, just like the demoniac, but not to serve yourself, but you are free to worship and to serve God, to serve others, and even, yes, to serve our governing authorities. When we us underestimate how bad we are without Christ, we also underestimate how changed we are with Christ. How changed we are when we are in Christ. That we are positionally justified. Converted. Regenerated. You don't have to sin like an unbeliever anymore. How's that for freedom? We don't have to sin like an unbeliever anymore. And this also informs how we live toward God and toward others. Paul says again in Galatians 5, 
we have freedom to serve one another humbly in love. If Jesus has changed you, you must live like a saved person. Now, if you are not a believer here today, if you're here just because of some sort of religious tradition for you, or you've been attending church your whole life thinking that you were a Christian, but you're not actually a Christian, this change is possible by following the same things that this man did here. You sit at Jesus' feet. You learn from him. You say, I can't follow myself and my passions, my lusts anymore. I must bow the knee in faith and repentance to Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, then live like who you are in Christ. Here's how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 5. Turn with me there for this final passage. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us. This is the message of reconciliation. Committed to us the message of reconciliation to proclaim it. Verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We who are in Christ are the righteousness of God. We are changed just as much as this demon-possessed man, this legion of demon-possessed man. To use the words of John Newton, I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Live changed because Jesus has changed you. Let's pray together. Father, our pre-Christ state is worse than we often think. And yet our in-Christ position is better than we often think. From the foundations of the world, you, our Father, called us, predestined us to be your children. And then that was accomplished and applied to us at the work of Christ on the cross. Bring any person here this morning who does not yet believe in repent in Jesus to a saving faith in repentance. And for those of us who are believers and repenters, keep us believing and repenting. Help us to live like who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name. stanza. Sorry, the second stanza. Breathe, oh breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breath. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find thy promised rest. Take away our love of sinning. Alpha and Omega be. End of faith at its beginning. Set our hearts at liberty. And we know from our passage that the heart that is set free by Jesus is a heart that praises him and wants to learn from him and wants to follow him. So let us stand and sing, love divine, all loves excel.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.